not for turning up. It uh, must be the charm of Paul <laughs> and the topic. The topic. Uh, yeah. um, Dr. Paul Bauman is from Cardiff. He's a reader in media and communication studies. He writes extensively on almost every subject I can see. Um, in, uh, representative books including martial arts studies, reading Rachel, Beyond Bruce Lee, Culture and the Media, Theorizing Bruce Lee, Deconstructing Popular Culture, and the Post-Marxism versus Cultural Studies. On top of that, he's also an experienced Tai Chi practitioner. So he's basically experiencing such cross-cultural communication on a daily basis. I guess, uh, like me, you probably can't wait to listening to his uh, speech, so I won't waste the time here. So let's welcome Paul for giving us this talk. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, I, I did circulate a written paper, right? But it doesn't matter. I had to write it out longhand in order to work out what I actually thought. So I've written it out longhand, and then I'll just I'll I'll, I'll talk to it. And I've done a prezi, which we which may or may not work. It seem it's. And, okay. Well. Um, anyway, so it doesn't. It, it's just something to look at, really, um, as we go along. So if you, um, who, who's seen the film M Butterfly, the Cronenberg film? There's some, fantastic. Okay. So um, the, the, my starting point for for this, I'll just put this on. I'll, I'll see. It keeps doing this. This is the problem we have here. So maybe I shall. Let's not rely too much on this. Let's not worry too much about it. Um, so the reason I've started from this is because Ray Chow wrote an essay that was published in, uh, in 1998 called The Dream of a Butterfly and it's a reading of this film that she uses uh, in which she critiques and interrogates the way that academics are using the notion of Orientalism which comes from Said's 1978 book Orientalism so everyone knows about Orientalism, and um, everyone is familiar with it. And also, we, we kind of train our students, or if we are students, we learn to identify it very quickly. So you see, you see, a, represent you see a Hollywood representation of China or Japan, and you see stereotypes, and you go, meh, 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 Orientalism! And then you start denouncing it, and you go, oh, just that's shocking, outrageous, Hollywood Orientalism, right? So any representation of um, the Middle East, the Far East, is called Orientalist. And Chow takes this and says, hang on a second, is that the full story, really? Is, is, that, is that all we should be doing with, um, with the idea of Orientalism? So she does the very cheeky thing of, well, but this is classic kind of Ray Chow. She'll juxtapose two different sorts of problematics that are meant to be that are sort of similar, but are often kept separate. So she uses, um, she explores this film, um, M. Butterfly, by David Cronenberg, um, which is based on a play by um, David Henry Huang. Um, and in order to think about desire, right? Because this is a film about cross-cultural desire. This is a film about a Western diplomat who... Um, falls in love or in lust or in, in you know, idolization of um, a Chinese, so this is the first encounter, of a Chinese um, opera singer, so this is Living Song, which you can't really see, but that's okay. Um, and it really, it really doesn't matter that much. Well, okay. Um, so where and what Chow does in this is to is she argues that Cronenberg is actually uses stripping back the bare essentials of the narrative to think about desire itself. And as one of my PhD students pointed out to me the other day, this film came out in '93. Cronenberg's next film was Crash, which is a film about sexual perversion and and. Um, and the desire to have sex with wounds and scars and, and amputation and so on. So, so, so this is a film. I think that justifies Chow's reading of this film um, as, as a film that is essentially about desire. And it's, it's kind of, 
she says that it problematizes the notion of Orientalism because there is Orientalism in it, definitely. Um, every time you listen to uh, René Gallimard talking, he, he kind of orientalizes song and she's his butterfly, he idealizes her, she's, she's not a person for him, she is something about China, she is some kind of um, orientalist stereotype. But, Chow points out, there are also, there's also desire running in different directions, there are all different sorts of desires at play in this film, and as we learn towards the end of the film, she, when she is revealed as a he, Pro professes a kind of love for René Gallimard. So it's, the desire has gone in two different directions. And so Chow explores this, the sense of seduction. So straight away it's not about Orientalism as some, as some kind of terrible crime, some kind of terrible fetishistic sort of stereotyping of the other. But what is it? What else is going on there? And she thinks through in terms of Baudrillard's idea of the lure um, um, and no, Lacan's idea of the lure and Baudrillard's idea of seduction. So she carries out a Lacanian um, psychoanalytic reading of, let's have a look, let's go back to the prison scene. A Lacanian psychoanalytic reading of the play in those terms. And she argues that there's something quite interesting going on because in this, in this final scene when um, René Gallimard and Song are together in the prison van, and, and Song kind of undresses and shows himself to be just a naked man and who, who basically says, let's start again, let's start again, let's cut through all of the crap. Gallimard kind of turns away in disgust. He's like, how could, you, how could you even think that I would be interested in you? Like, you're just a man. The thing that I'm in love with is a woman invented by a man. <clears throat> so when Chow reads this, she talks about what Lacan calls the, the non-coincidence of um, eye and gaze, of the eye and gaze. So it, in Lacanian psychoanalysis, this is quite an interesting problematic, which is, I mean, it structures a lot of kind of Lacanian readings of everything. So for example, if you, Slavoj Žižek, who, who I have immense problems with, immense problems with Slavoj Žižek, but, but does some very, makes some very interesting points which really kind of illuminate Lacanian, the importance of the gaze and fantasy in psycho psychoanalytic understandings of identity. So, so Zizek, for example, gives the example of a basketball player who's a superstar basketball player who's, you know, slam dunking and all the rest of it. And Zizek, Zizek says that the investment, the, the, the fantasy of the, that basketball player is not to be on the pitch, to be on the court, shooting hoops and scoring goals or whatever it is you do in basketball. But actually, it's in the moment of enjoyment afterwards when you go back home and you watch the video of your own performance and imagine your fans watching you thinking you are great. That's so so your, your sense of identity is completely implicated in your fantasies about what you think other people might see you as. So already... Um, You've got this, so, so for Lacan and for Chow, it's a, it's a non-coincidence of eye and gaze. So Lacan comes up with, Lacan puts it as something like, um, you never see me like where I think I am, and, and I never see what I hope to see in you, because we all, we're always fantasizing about the other. So straight away, Chow is kind of deconstructing by using psychoanalysis. The idea of any simple... Um, communication or encounter or relationship or desire that's not already overdetermined by misrecognition, by some kind of misconception, some kind of fantasy, some kind of stereotype, some kind of idealization, and some kind of um, non coincidence of um, what I'm looking at with what I'm seeing, because the object of my desire in this sense, is not actually the thing, not actually the person. Now, Zizek goes further, right? And, and Zizek, in another essay somewhere, argues that if, in, in Lacanian terms, in the psychoanalytic theory of Jacques Lacan, the truth of sexuality, the truth of sex, is not that of two becoming one, and in, a, in some intimate, unmediated 
bonding. But actually, in the act, in the physical act of sex, says Zizek, it's still a relationship of fantasy. So the, the two lovers who are even looking closely in each other's eyes, they're not actually seeing each other, they're seeing a fantasy object that they have constructed. So Zizek then takes the next necessary step, if you are Slav or Zizek, and you have to make jokes about everything, um, to, to argue that the truth of sexuality is not heterosexual um, copulation, but masturbation. So for, for Zizek, sex is essentially a kind of masturbation, it's essentially a kind of aided masturbation, right? Which always reminds me of a joke that a rugby player once said to me, which was, um, sex is all right, but you can't beat the real thing, right? <laughs> Um, but, but, so that's Zizek, and that's Zizek taking Lacanian theory in one direction, but I think that Chow takes it in a different and more interesting direction, because she doesn't take the full court kind of Zizekian leap into fantasy as an impost. So Zizek's a Lacanian, and for, for Lacan, the subject is always a barred subject, like we, our relationship with ourself, we can't have a a truthful relationship with ourself because it's constructed by a fantasy. We can't have a truthful, unmediated relationship with any other because it's constructed in the way, it, getting in between us is a fantasy, whether that's a stereotype or some kind of um, um, problem of any other kind. But Chow kind of goes, yeah, we've got that, we get that. But what can we do with that? And I think that Chow's um, exploration of it um, moves us into some quite interesting ways of thinking because it's almost like for Zizek or for, for like a hyper Lacanian approach our identities are organized by fantasies and that's it and that it's, it's all masturbatory and it's all kind of internal to self but there's a different take on it which is the sense in which the argument in um in psychoanalysis or psychoanalytic cultural theory, which has been quite widely known or widely thought since the 1980s, that, ident that desire and identity are so interconnected that you can't talk about the one without talking about the other. So this goes all the way back to people like the, the book that, the first book that I read this in was a book called The Subject of Semiotics by Kaja Silverman, Silverman, which was published in 1982. And I think that this is an interesting correlation. There's an interesting set of questions about um, the nature of desire, the nature of my desire, right? the nature of your desire, the nature of anyone's desire. And we tend to think that our desires sort of arise spontaneously within us somehow, or if, you know, the kind of, the kind of mainstream treatments of desire are generally kind of Darwinian and, and evolutionist, right? We haven't moved on from, like, Desmond Morris or whoever it was who wrote The Naked Ape, right? It's like that we are attracted to people for um, biological reasons of the survival of the species and all of this kind of stuff. But the idea that a certain set of fantasies might make you, attract, might make you attracted to someone or some, or, or some idea of something is interesting because that suggests that although our desires don't necessarily arise within us, they can actually change us. So I'm interested in the question of, of desire. Is desire something that you can choose, right? Is it something that you can choose? Is it somehow preordained? That, that's not, that, doesn't, that doesn't work for me. So how does desire grow? How does, so how in a film like M. Butterfly does it become kind of so all-consuming to the extent that at the end of the film, René Gallimard realises this, realises that he's desiring something impossible that could never be true. And he, his identity kind of implodes. He, he dresses himself up and he puts the, the, uh, the makeup on and then he kills himself very, very in, a, in, a, in a public performance, in a, a kind of play um, in prison. And it's a really bizarre and powerful scene which I shouldn't be looking at because it's distracting me from from what I'm trying to say. Um, but the, the question that interests me is, in terms of Ray Chow focuses on the idea of the lure, seduction, 
and the, the kind of the growing of desire, like presumably at the start of M. Butterfly, Song was not actually attracted to René Gallimard. She was doing, she was carrying out her role as a spy working for the Chinese government. But by the end of the film, the man who was presenting himself as Song clearly loves René Gallimard. So how does that happen? Whereas at the same, the kind of reverse movement has happened for um, for Gallimard. He's now repulsed because of the the physical reality of the person in front of him. That's not what he was in love with at all. So this got me to thinking: if if Chow is focusing on the start of desire and the start of the relationship, um. And if identity and desire are really comp complexly involved in each other, in what we desire either says or, 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 or causes something to do with our identity to change, perhaps. I'm wondering if this is something that we can let happen or something that we can resist. Or That's quite interesting. Um, but what happens at the other end? So, you know, so René Gallimard here is about to kill himself. He's about to just uh, break the mirror and stick it into his throat. Um, what happens when you see through the kind of myth and the fantasy of the object of your desire? Do you necessarily, does that kill the desire or, or, or what happens at that stage? So, in thinking about this, I was thinking that when Ray Chow displaces the question of Orientalism away from um, questions of racism or questions of, of, of colonialism, and she displaces it onto the question of, of, of the formation of identity and subjective desire, if we think about the term cross-cultural desire, we automatically, or we may automatically, or maybe this is just me, if you play that game, what's the first thing you think of? Cross-cultural desire. Ooh, sex. Ooh, oh, damn. Did I say that? <coughs> you know, if, if we think cross if we move the word desire and put the emphasis on cross-cultural and we start to displace these questions into away from um, physical attraction and sexuality and so on and into the realms of culture then that can be that can be quite potentially illuminating so um, so I'm thinking about the kind of there's a long history of, of cross-cultural desire um, which is the Western interest in, say, supposedly mystical cultural practices from China, as exemplified by something like Tai Chi Chuan. Um, so there are some people doing, doing a Tai Chi form in Shanghai. Um, and this kind of image of China has proven to be extremely attractive to Westerners, and the question is: Is that Orientalism? Well, yes, it often it often is. It often is. Well, straight away. So the the study that that interests me here is a book by a guy called Adam Frank, who wrote a book that came out in two thousand and six, the PDF of which is now freely available online, called Tai Chi Chuan and the Search for the Little Old Chinese Man, um, and the subtitle is Understanding Identity through Martial Arts. And he talks in that book about the fact that, so he's from America, he's in North America, and he's, he's encountered Tai Chi Chuan, and he thinks it's great, and he loves it, and, and he wants to go to China to learn it. So he goes to China to learn it, and as he's going through the process of learning, so there's him, and there's students from all over Europe and from elsewhere, they've all come to, they've come to Shanghai, because they want to find real Tai Chi, right? They want to find ultimate Tai Chi. They don't want hippie Tai Chi like you get in North America. They want So they have an idea of the authentic, an idea and a fantasy of the real, and a fantasy of the true. And he comes to the realisation that actually what he's looking for is an impossible Orientalist construct of a little old Chinese kind of temple abbot or something with a white beard. And, and these images have all come from the Western media, predominantly the Western media, but also from you know certain types of Chinese legend and so on, as they've been um, translated into different cultural contexts. And this causes him an immense problem. 
and he discusses the way that in which some people get there and they go and they spend months learning Tai Chi and they go, oh, there's no, there is no little old Chinese man. This, 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 what I'm doing is, I could, I could be doing this in Europe. I could be doing this in North America. And that kind of shattering of the, of the fantasy, um, what happens at that stage? So some, this causes some people, obviously, to, to lose interest because all of a sudden, when you realise you're not going to turn into a Jedi Knight, um, which, you know, th so this is Hollywood appropriation, isn't it? The Hollywood appropriation of, of, of uh, orientalization, orientalism in Star Wars. The Jedi Knight, the Jedi Knight is a Shaolin monk, isn't he? And, and the Force is chi, of course, yeah? Um, what happens when you realise that that's just a fantasy? That, that there's a real thing that you're doing that, that is very, very different or, or um, somehow a little bit more disappointing? And... This is the thing that interests me, because Adam Frank argues, maybe if I look at my own notes here, I could get back on track in some way. I am on track. I'm perfectly on, on track. I've just, just momentarily forgotten what I'm talking about. Um, so one thing that Frank keeps reiterating throughout the book is that identity moves. It's a phrase that he keeps using, identity moves. So identity is always a kind of conjunctural, um, contingent, construct, but if you kind of marry his idea to the, the, the post-structuralist cultural studies type of assertion that identity and desire are complexly imbricated and involved in each other, why does your identity move? Your identity moves because, because your desire moves, maybe. So, optimistically, my suggestion is... Oh, no, there's, there's a few different suggestions that I would possibly make. Let's, we've had enough Tai Chi, haven't we? Let's see where... We haven't, we've never had enough Tai Chi, by the way. Um, this, I, I put one quotation up on the screen here. So, one common thread that ran both through the fieldwork and archival research for this book was the desire um, among both Chinese and non-Chinese practitioners to find a teacher who embodied the Tai Chi Chuan they had read about in books or seen in movies or about whom they had heard stories as a child. While such tales of power did not dominate my interactions with fellow practitioners, they often found their way into our conversations. It was certainly at the heart of my own initial impulse to travel to Shanghai and to meet the then 87-year-old Ma Yuan Yang for the first time in 1988. So this is, there's, there's a lot um, going on here. You can see that Yes, there was something kind of orientalist in his desire to go all the way to China. But at the same time as I said, this was shared, this fantasy is shared equally by the Chinese practitioners. So it's not a kind of um, orientalism in the same sense, but it's a romanticization of the past, a fetishistic kind of overvaluation of the, of the past that you see being kind of capitalized upon today. We were just talking about this, this earlier, the way that the... Um, the Shaolin Temple has been turned into a, a it's like a, a Disneyland sort of tourist resort. The way that martial arts like Wing Chun in Hong Kong have, be, have gained um, intangible cultural heritage status in UNESCO. You know, these things are all being commodified, their histories are being produced and invented. So, so this I think kind of cross cuts the Orientalist claim or problematizes it. Like the, the Chinese practitioners are just as Orientalist as the Western pilgrims who go to China to learn it. And then there's an expression, in here, there's a phrase in here that I really like. While such tales of power did not dominate... Oh, before that, images that we'd seen in movies or in books, the Chinese representations of, of martial artists and Taoists and Taoist immortals and all the rest of it are just as impossible as the Western representations of the same. So we've all seen the same movies, we've all, we've all heard the same stories, that's East and West, that's Chinese and non-Chinese. <coughs> but this is the expression that I like. While such tales of power did not dominate my interactions with fellow practitioners, they often found their way into our conversations. So the, I think that there's something really important here. Because when you are doing Tai Chi, um, when you are, particularly if you're doing push hands, so push hands, um, 
Where am I? Push hands. I'll show you some push hands. If I can just find me. Actually, I could have done this, couldn't I? But this is probably crashed in some way. Yeah. So this, yeah. I don't know why it's doing this, but there you go. Um, so if we go to, this isn't push hands. This is, this is Tai Chi wrestling, which is just a, it's an exercise. It's just an exercise. When you're doing this kind of thing, you're doing this kind of um, interaction with a, with a partner, you can not preserve your, the, the normal things, the normal sense of self, your normal intentions, your normal plans. And I've practiced many different martial arts and I've been involved in many different types of sparring. And Tai Chi push hands is quite unique in the sense that you really can't have strategy. You have to go absolutely uh, where the force goes, where the gaps go, where the gaps arise, and so on and so on. Um, you never meet force with force. You have to yield to it. And the whole training is in this kind of <coughs> postural sensitivity. So Adam Frank takes this idea and argues that um, um, that in these moments, not this moment, this is, this is a, a bit messy. Um, this is someone just getting chucked around, actually, by their instructor. Um, in these moments, identity is completely gone, right? And he's not, he's not purely a hippie in that sense of, like, you know, merging with the, with the Tao or something like this. But if we tie this back to the um, observation that these kind of discourses don't intervene in our practice. So when, you, when you're practicing push hands, when you're practicing Tai Chi, um, you're not thinking about films. You're not thinking about Orientalist fantasies. You, you, you can't be. There's, some, there's a very different set of um, things going on here in these encounters, um, which is kind of non-mediated. The whole, the, all of the discourse, all of the ideology, in a sense, falls away. I don't think that it falls away when you're doing the Tai Chi form. So Adam Frank argues that wherever you are in the world, that when you're doing the Tai Chi form, uh, he argues that you've got this kind of sense of, like, you're engaging somehow with, you know, with ancient China, right? And, and you're getting a feel for Chineseness, which I think is probably true. When you're doing when you're doing the solo movements, then there's all sorts of stuff going through your head. When you're doing any kind of two partner interaction, um, it's very different. So, so Adam Frank argues that they don't dom that these kind of myths and ideologies and fantasies don't dominate practice. They do dominate the conversations afterwards. So that led me to start thinking about, well, the sense of identity moving shows that we don't have one identity at, all the time. So um, one minute, if I'm talking about Tai Chi, I can have a very different identity to the person who's practicing the Tai Chi. Um, so I think that this, the, the sort of physicality of the encounter um, makes identity fall away and leads to a sense in which um, if for someone like René Gallimard in M. Butterfly, reality can never live up to the fantasy that he's constructed. And I think that the opposite can also be said, that when you're actually involved in the, kind, in the cross-cultural practice, the cross-cultural activity, the cross-cultural encounter, the initial myth or fantasy or desire does not live up to the pleasures and satisfactions and things that, that, that can't be expressed, that you can't have known in advance. So I'll finish off because these things are always more interesting when it's just a conversation than when it's just someone talking. So I will just, I'll skip to the conclusion. And the conclusion is connected to the idea of the cross-cultural encounter. Now, in the first draft of this that I wrote, I, I went on a bit of a tangent about the Tai Chi that I learned um, in, in Britain, in England specifically, actually. And it was, and thinking about it, it was kind of three generations removed from any Chinese teacher. And so I was thinking, when I was writing that particular draft, you know when you go off kind of down on a different tangent to the one that you really want, it becomes confessional in that sense. I was thinking, well, what, what do I say about how can the Tai Chi that I have learned be 
regarded as a, a, a cross-cultural encounter. And then I thought, aha, I'm making the assumption that culture is a thing, that culture is a noun, right? Like, it's, it's, an, it's a thing that you can own, like you can pick it up and put it in your pocket, like it's my thing that I own. But if we just change our understanding of culture slightly and let make changing it less from noun object to verb process, then you can see that culture is something that happens. Culture is something that happens in encounters. Um, so I think that this enables us to kind of bypass a lot of the a lot of the um, fights that we get into about things like Orientalism. Because in the Tai Chi that I um, practiced, there was very little China involved. There was very little. There was Chinese terms, but there was very little reference to China. There was very little hippie shit. There was very little Taoism. There was very little mysticism. Um, and so that was and wasn't an encounter with something that was cross-cultural. Right? At times, it, it felt bizarre. Because I was thinking, well, is this is this actually Tai Chi? Is this a real thing? Is, it, is this just something that they've made up? Like, so I, I had to. I felt compelled when I went to Hong Kong to have it verified. Like, as I presented myself, like, is this what I'm doing now? Is this Tai Chi? <laughs> like, because it just didn't. It, I needed that kind of cross cultural um, verification or validation. But I think that it's important not to essentialize around categories or to fantasize around categories like China or the West. Europe or North America or whatever, because actually the processes and, and the practices are quite translatable. And I think that in the in the conclusion to the um, the that particular written version that you have there, I kind of move it back from the psychoanalytic thinking about about identity and more into the the the, the Derridian deconstruction of ideas like a fixed identity or, or, a, or a sense of culture as property. Um, because the one thing that Derrida, and this is Derrida all the way from the very, the very early books when Derrida was writing in the 70s, Derrida argued that there is always difference. There is always cultural difference. Even within so the, this, I'm adding the word cultural here. This Derrida doesn't say cultural difference. I'm saying there is always cultural difference. Even within supposedly the same culture, there's always difference. And difference always, it's like it's like differential heating of the Earth's surface produces wind, and as we've noticed today, and produces kind of different forces. Difference produces kind of attractions and repulsions and forces and so on. And Derrida's argument was that really one of the biggest dangers is to reduce difference to opposition. So even, in a sense, even accepting the binary, the Orientalist binary of um, the West and the rest, or, or um, um, Asia and not Asia, or Chinese Tai Chi and not, not Chinese Tai Chi, you're already, you're already involved in, in what are ultimately political and politically dodgy categories you know, if you're going to insist on an essential difference between... This is where we talked about authentic, didn't we? Yes, we did, just before we started, Jan. We talked about, I think, that this restaurant that we're going to tonight is the most authentic. <laughs> and then the conversation of, what do you mean, what do you mean authentic? And this is like, this is the, this is, if you ever kind of suggest to an Italian that uh, there might be such a thing as good pasta outside of, like, five miles of where they were born, they, 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 they just go, what? Are you mad? And you can't get Italian. You can't get Italian food in Britain. To which the only response is, I think that the Italians who moved to Britain and cook that food might be hurt by the suggestion that what they are now cooking is, is not Italian. So, um, so yeah. So this 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 whole process is is me using these using Ray Chow's thinking about sexuality and gender to think about cross cultural encounters and to work out ways of engaging with them, theorizing them, understanding them in, in ways that don't just, you don't just judge them and go, that's Orientalist, but that's okay. That's Orientalist because it's Hollywood, right? Or because it's, but that's not Orientalist because it's in an art gallery. 
an installation and it's got you know sound effects with it. Um, I don't like that kind of thing. But at the same time, it, it, it's kind of working out how do we move on from these, these core problematics of things like post-colonialism and cultural studies. Um, there's some more Tai Chi there. I think I might end by showing you uh, me getting hit in the head. This is me getting hit in the head. Wham! Right. And the good thing about that is that was an uh, authentic Sao Choi from uh, Choi Lee Foot. So not just any hit in the head. But an authentic bang. So I'm going to end on a bang. I'll stop there and um, ask me anything you like and I'll do my best to answer. <laughs>